Well, hi there, everybody. Um, really good to be back at Low Carb USA. Would have loved to have seen you all in person. Uh, I think back to when we first launched in Low Carb USA way back when in 2017, and it's you know it's a shame to to not get together with everybody. But I guess we should start a little bit with a, a disclaimer. Um, my name is Dorian Greenell. I am the founder of Keto Mojo, as doing business uh, as Keto Check in the United States. Um, we sell a blood glucose and ketone meter both here in the United States and in Europe. I have been living keto since um, uh, 2015 and I'm also the chairman and founder of the Ketogenic Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit um, that fosters uh, ketogenic education, medical research and information sharing for the benefit of improving um, humankind. So. I am biased, without a doubt. I am biased to um, uh, to keto. So um, uh, take that into to a to account when we, we go through these um, uh, slides. So uh, this is, you know, if you can't measure something, you can't manage it. Next, and if you can't manage it, you can't control it. Next, and if you can't control it, you can't improve it. And Measurement is the first step that leads to control and uh, eventually um, uh, to improvement. You can see what I was like before and how I was after. So move to the next one here. Today we're gonna go over the value of glucose and ketone testing uh, for the, both the patient, the practitioner, and society. So a lot of people just measure ketones. And if you're not measuring glucose, you are missing um, half the picture. So this is based upon testing both of those. Um, I've put, touched up a little bit of the GKI here, and that's the interplay between the your glucose measurement um, in millimoles divided by your ketone measurement. GKI we're seeing is a, as an up and coming one. So you have basically three numbers you could go off glucose, ketone, or, or GKI. But let's dive in a little bit here as to, um, uh, as to the benefit um, uh, and value of um, uh, ketone for the patient. So first of all, you get this instant biofeedback that the dietary choices are or are not working for that individual and helping them maintain compliance. I mean, how many times have I seen on social media when somebody is saying, will this kick me out of ketosis? And they're going to go and ask into the, into the interwebs uh, the question to them. And the keto police are going to come back and say, that's not keto. And I kind of like look at it saying, well, you know, that carrot and that beef bourguignon might not be a problem to you. But, you know, if you're not testing, you're just guessing. And having this instant biofeedback helps you actually change the way that you approach your food and how you can get actual compliance. If you test and in your state of nutritional ketosis, you know that the dietary choices you are making for you and your bioindividuality are actually working for you. And that is um, a, a beautiful feat um, in, in that respect. People also get this direct connection between their food and their blood glucose. I cannot tell you how many people, you know, they go, oh, it's, it's brown bread. Oh, it's ancient grains of the Aztecs. You know, oh, it's forbidden rice, you know. Uh, but at the end of the day, as we all know, carbohydrate gets converted to glucose. And people need to understand this. And having that instant feedback at that moment, they can work out what they can and cannot do. Now, Dr. Eric Westman says he has this 20 gram total rule. But what if you could be in a state of nutritional ketosis and burning fat at 30 grams or 40 grams? And is that net or is that total? I mean, what is the individual's, well, you know, what is that person's bioindividuality that comes into place? And so what you get here is with, with testing, for you, you can really start to see what your choices are doing. And so on both a physiological and psychological basis, you can start to affect change um, uh, in, your, in your life. 
So what you do is you can get this gamification of lifestyle changes is the way that I like to look at it. You know, I remember, you know, when, when I was first starting, I was 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and then I got to 0 0.5, and yes, I was in Ketopia. I made it into nutritional ketosis, and every day on social media, I see people, they're taking their, their meter and they're showing it up and saying, look, I'm in ketosis, and you know, that's, that's a wonderful thing. I, I, I tested myself this morning and I, I was doing really good. I was at a 3.7 and I'd had wine last night and I was really happy. So having this gamification really gives your feedback. And now with modern systems um, that we have, uh, like with our latest um, device, we can now interlink to other platforms through a secure HIPAA compliant cloud. So we can connect with Chronometer, uh, we can connect with Biocanics, Heads Up Health. Soon we'll have EHR systems like Elation Health and Serbo and others. We have a pipeline from maybe another 30 um, connections hopefully this year. So you really get this gamification that comes on into play that can help you on your personal um, uh, journey. We get control of self, or should I say self-control? Yeah. And what I mean by this is, you know, if you've got a type two diagnosis or you've got a, uh, a cancer diagnosis, all of a sudden, it seems that the control that you have gets left over to a, to a doctor or a medical professional or a nurse practitioner. And they're gonna say, you need to do this and take this pill. But when you start to change the way you eat and you can see your blood glucose come down, you get the self-control. You get that control of yourself back to you. That says like, you've got this. You are the one that can affect change. And this becomes extremely powerful. Rather than saying, oh, it is the, the farmer's pr um, uh, problem because they didn't create the pill and it didn't work well for you. Here you can actually you, see you affect that change. And that control of self becomes really empowering to the individual that, they have, um, uh, that they've actually got that. And so then we come to lower healthcare costs. I've pulled up the Verta study here, and I hope that's coming through. 55% type two diabetes reversal. Well, imagine how much I think the cost of diabetes is almost $10,000 per year for an individual once they get a diagnosis. Think of the, co the lowering of your um, healthcare costs. If you can reduce down, uh, you can eliminate or reduce down your use of exogenous insulin by 91%. We've seen people who are type one diabetics reduce down their insulin load by 40 to 50% by having good quality control of their, um, of, the, of their glucose. And also the number of hypoglycemic responses that a type one diabetic could have can also significantly reduce. 67% reduction in diabetes medication. So by testing your glucose, testing your ketones, adjusting how you approach your lifestyle and a diet, you can lower your costs. And now we can also come into a little bit of here about talking about nutrient density. When you're eating nutrient dense foods, do you need to be eating as much? If uh, I would love to see if there's any clinical trial and study comes in that as to whether or not you can actually lower your food costs a little bit. Uh, I think this would be very interesting. I mean, if one evaluated what a healthcare cost is versus food costs, I think I'd rather prefer to spend money on my food than pay the money on my healthcare in that respect. So let's look at the value for the practitioner. Testing glucose. Number one thing here is safety. Uh, you know, Dr. Eric Westman said that, uh, I think on one of your low-carb um, uh, USA, I think it was a, um, a panel, uh, he mentioned that a, a nutritional ketosis in the ketogenic diet is prescription strength. Uh, and what I mean by that, the safety for the doctor, you know, when I talk to, to a lot of them, their main concern when somebody first goes keto is the ability to de-prescribe medications so that individual doesn't have a hypoglycemic episode. De-prescribe. That's incredible that that can happen in such a short space of time. So testing of um, glucose is really important to keep that safety, to do that, um, so you have that do no harm that comes into play. 
outcomes and results we touched before, and I'm going to come back to the Verta study again and again. But I, I remember a story by um, uh, Dr. Andreas Ansfeld about how he first started to become the diet doctor, where he was despondent that the the way that he was um, uh, what he was doing in his practice was not changing anybody's outcome. It wasn't making a difference, and it was only when he started going low carb that he suddenly realized that he could change the outcomes of his patients. And you know, if we take a look at this, this is what a doctor wants to do at the end of the day. He wants a better outcome for the patient, and he wants a better result. And so, measuring glucose and measuring ketones is the way that you can do this. The um, the measurement of ketones helps you keep the um, uh, the compliance that is re required. So we, we talk about compliance and accountability, and I want to kind of like put up there, Verda had a 74% uh, retention. And that means that 74% of the people that were on the program stayed on the program and had those successful results. Now, if you contrast that to somebody just taking medication, 28% of patients don't take their medications. So you have a methodology by testing ketones and knowing that that individual is in a state of nutritional ketosis that gives you that compliance that gives you the accountability for that um, uh, individual and that is huge and you can do this remotely through the web by connecting the device through to a phone and that goes into the cloud and the data can come on in instantly and it's better than taking a, um, uh, a pill and you know that remote patient monitoring is where a game changes can come on in if you think about what happens in a, when you go and do an inpatient, you've got to go on in, you've got to see the, um, uh, the receptionist, you've got to fill out all of the forms that is there, you've got to wait a while, then you've got to go into the exam room, you're going to have the pre-exam that goes on, and then probably the practitioner's got five exam or six exam rooms that is going so that they can do all the preamble and, and the practitioner can bounce from one patient to another patient to another patient. Well, imagine if that's all done now digitally for you, a digital intake, a digital fill out of, um, uh, of your, your biomarkers of what's going on in your life, being able to see in, in real time the data set that comes on in. You now have less um, uh, pressure on, on, your, or on needing to have, say, five exam rooms. You might be able to get away with one or two exam rooms where you do the first initial exam in person, and then the rest can be done remote. You have the ability to be scalable as you go on through. So you can say, hold on, I want to take a look at every patient today that has a blood glucose over 140 milligrams per day, and I want to focus in on that individual. Then you're getting your resources being um, allocated correctly instead of seeing everybody on an intake as they come on through. And so the value of glucose and ketone tasting and remote patient monitoring really starts to be extremely beneficial for a, um, uh, for a practice. And now that we have found that we have modern CPT codes, there's been a, a way of changing the way that CPT codes, which is the billing, that you are able to now monetize metabolic health therapies. So first of all, um, the 9453 there, I'm not too sure if everybody can read the text on that, um, uh, this allows you during that first initial meeting to introduce um, uh, the piece of equipment, be it a, a pulse ox or a blood pressure cuff or, or a glucometer, and show them how to use the equipment there in, in, in an inpatient setting. Then 99454 allows you to review that data, that 30 days of data or a period of data, once every that, and be able to charge in your practice for it. Um, there is also the ability to do follow-ups with a nurse practitioner with a 99457, which means that remotely utilizing telemedicine techniques, you are able to affect change and outcomes and be able to scale your, your practice. Um, I think Dr. Tro mentioned once when I was, was chatting to him that, you know, if he, he was looking at it from a a patient's perspective, like that patient doesn't have to drive half an hour, three quarters of an hour to that doctor's appointment and waste that time. That patient can actually spend time in the gym. And for the doctor, the doctor can take care and allocate the resources um, a lot better by using RPM. So the value of glucose and ketone testing is huge um, uh, in that um, uh, factor.
And so as we move on through uh, from the value of the practitioner, um, uh, we can come to the, the value of um, uh, to, to society. Lowering the burden of healthcare costs. This is from the American Diabetes Association. $327 billion is spent annually on type 2 diabetes. $327 billion. That's incredible. And yet, we have clinically shown that we can reverse the effects of type 2 diabetes in potentially 55% of that population. That's $150 billion in just one non-communicable disease that could adjust. We could lower down the cost of the insulin and the burden to society. And I kind of like think of this, if you were thinking as like a business, if you're like a, a healthcare company and you're providing healthcare and you're getting on one side premiums from an individual and on the other side of the ledger, you're having to pay out for that individual. If you could suddenly reduce down the healthcare costs to you as an organization while still maintaining those premiums, think of the margin a healthcare company could make there. And it's amazing that I'm not seeing more healthcare companies take a good hard look at this and say like, hold on, we can keep, still keep the, com the command of the price of those premiums, but we could lower our costs and make people healthier and get better outcomes that, that'll come into play. You can reduce 67% of your medication. This will be an incredible, and it's a low cost option. And what I mean by that, is you know when we talked about the patient earlier on about lowering their costs you know one of the things i forgot to mention that moment is the cost of testing itself okay you've got a 45 dollar machine and then you've got the strips that come on after that but you test a lot to begin with but as you learn and develop and you test and you're in ketosis and you test and your blood glucose alone and as we as our creatures of habit in time the need to test diminishes because we've turned it from being a, a, um, a diet into being a lifestyle. And when you live this way, like I have since 2015, it becomes extremely easy. And the world has changed a lot since then. Now I can go down to most um, supermarkets and there will definitely be some keto product for sale, especially here in January, as keto is absolutely um, everywhere. There are definitely more plethora of products that is available to you. There's more apps that are going to allow you to track your foods and all of those things. And so it becomes a lot easier. And so now we have actually started to change the way society views it. Greater health span. I kind of want to put this into a real big context here. When you get a type 2 diabetes diagnosis, uh, according to a recent study um, uh, that was at diabetes.org UK, you know, you've got a 10-year less lifespan. That's 10 years using conventional methods that we ha have had. But you could have 10 years less of life. And there were some Stanford economists put the cost per year of loss of life at $129,000. Uh, they actually kind of like used uh, kidney dialysis um, uh, to kind of like develop the benchmark on that. But 129,000, if there's 10 years left, that's $1.29 million is being lost in productivity revenue in the economy because of type two diabetes for one individual. There are over 79,000 deaths um, uh, because of diabetes, according to the CDC. I mean, I tried to do the math of that. My calculator didn't have enough numbers to calculate out the cost of what this, th this is to society. And we can simply change this. And we can do it scalably with tools that are already in place by measuring glucose and ketones. And I think this is a profound thing that could, could, could help society as a whole. The quality of life. You know, you take a look at ketogenic diets and, you know, it's not just type 2 diabetes. It is epilepsy. We have seen the reduction in seizures um, through a well-regulated ketogenic diet. The, obviously, the classic story is the, from the Charlie Foundation there with, with Danny Abrams. I mean, but you, you take a look at the reduction on, of seizures. We can take a look at maybe a, a woman who's got polycystic ovarian syndrome being able to conceive. What, what difference of quality in life could happen to, that, to her because of this? 
neurological diseases, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's. Um, uh, we have seen that um, we can get greater quality of life in later years. But what if we actually, when you start looking at all of these studies that have been coming out, what if we started going low carb in general and that becoming the default instead of the high carb? We wouldn't be, we can be preventative on that. And then we would see these non-communicable diseases come on down. We would see the change. What is the effect on that young lady or gentleman who has chronic acne and then when they reduce the inflammation it starts to dissipate the psoriasis can actually come on down you know there are multiple layers that can come on into play here and so a quality of life for society by going low carb can be greatly enhanced the prevention and reversal of ncds as i mentioned um, uh, slightly before non-communicable diseases by 2030 will be 47 trillion dollars that's it 47 trillion dollars and we know that a low carb lifestyle can have a profound effect on that for society you know we do why well, i do wonder that is actually keto the default and glucose not why would your body be allow you to store so much fat and then allow you to gently release it for endurance. Yet for glucose, it only allows you to store maybe 2,000 calories. That's why the, you know, the endurance runners hit the wall. Why is it that for glucose to get across the, the blood-brain barrier, it needs a transporter, a GLUT1 or a GLUT2 ship to, to take it over, but ketones can cross the blood-brain barrier, no problem. You know, it is only the advent in agriculture of the last 10,000 years have we had this abundance of um, carbohydrates in society and if we think about the genesis of this if we go back into Mesopotamia the bread basket this is where the big armies started to march it was conquesting other nations as to why we have cheap carbohydrates but is having that the optimal way for us to live as human beings is Eating carbohydrates is going to give us this wonderful health span where we live long and vibrant lives. We just say, just because that's the way we've always done it, or done it for the last 10,000 years, is it right? Because what did we do for the prior 2.6 million years? We were hunter-gatherers. As the family gets the choice of picking little seeds from the prairie or taking down the elk, what are they going to choose? Taking down the elk and feeding their, their family for six months or longer? This is where the difference comes on into play. You know, I put sequestration of carbon here is the benefit of society because it's really not the cow, it is the how. If we take a look at the savory, some work that's coming out of the Savory Institute, uh, it is possible utilizing regenerative agriculture that you can sequester 3.5 kilograms of carbon for every kilogram that is produced. Let's, let's step back here. You know, everybody does the what about and they want to, well, they want to point and saying, oh, it's cow farts is the problem that, that is here. And not really the problem of how much we are actually polluting uh, the world with, um, uh, with our vehicles and uh, the way that we are driving, but they want to point to like it's being, you can't eat that way, but yes, you can. Yes, you can through regenerative agriculture. And we, a cow does not compete with us for food. It actually eats grass. I can't eat grass. It actually eats clovers. And it can be grown on non-arable land, on the hillsides that we, we cannot farm. And it can be grown in silvio pasturing where we can stack functions uh, on the land. And what I mean by that, you can have a tree crop overstory underneath, you can have the, the cattle going through, you can have lumber that can come on into play as a, as a secondary revenue generation. You can eat the animal nose to tell, utilizing the fats that come off it. We know how to, to store up the fats so they are shelf stable. We can actually go through a huge temperate range. We can go into the tropics and we can you know, if you think about tropics and trying to grow coconuts in there for your fats, it's very easy. You can also put dates. Dates, they're not. They're not. Keto, are they? No, they're not. But you can certainly feed them to a pig in the understory. 
and let the pig go through and pick them up so you don't even actually have to harvest the date palms. So you're lowering your cost by creating animal feed and you can do that in a permanent fashion tree crop where you're not having to till the soil all the time to put in points in. So how did we get from testing glucose and ketones to try and changing the way that we do agricultural fundamentally? Because when you test glucose and you test ketones and you're in a state of nutritional quintosis, the way that you shop the outer aisle can start to have a market forcing function and can change the way the farming paradigm needs to be done globally and locally. We can bring back paying jobs to farmers. We can bring back family farming. We can stack functions in the marketplace. We look at Polyface Farm and the work that Joel Salatin has been doing there where he'll have the cows go through and then in a mob and then move them onto the next piece. And then he brings the chickens in and uh, um, a while afterwards, after the flies have gone on in to, to make the larvae and the chickens will go on in getting the larvae that is in the cow pats, but they're spreading the cow pats, giving nutrients, nitrogen to the grass that has just been cropped. And now the grass grows bigger and stronger. We meanwhile, it's putting down more roots, sequestering carbon. It is not the cow. It is the how. And this is how we can fundamentally change not only the health of our global society, but also the wealth of the global society through changing these pieces. And I think that can ultimately be the greatest benefit you can get from glucose and ketone testing. And there we have it. I kept that under the 45 minutes, so I, I thank you everybody for uh, taking the time to listen, and um, I'm very open to um, uh, questions that you might have. Yeah, Cecile just made a comment about she loves, it's the how, not the cow. Um, uh, so that, I won't take, I won't take, um, uh, I won't take um, uh, ownership of that one. That was actually Joel Salatin of Polyface Farm. I once saw him wearing a t-shirt saying, it's not the cow, it is the how. And I think it's really important that we retake a look at how we, we are doing um, pastoral agriculture. I mean, there is many areas in, in the globe um, where we can use, uh, through regenerative agriculture, marginal lands. Um, you know, by being able to utilize, uh, there's, there's a, if, I would say Google greening the desert. Uh, and this is a permacultural principle. It is possible through design architecture, design of the land, that we can increase the, the inputs, the water into the, the aquifer and we can learn to grow grass and we can bring it back you know, we look across Scotland and Northern England and there are these massively denuded areas and people go, well, you know, that's where they're just growing um, uh, grass, but we've cut down all the trees. Uh, so we can really sequester carbon through regenerative agriculture. And rather than subsidizing obesity, which is killing Americans by subsidizing corn, soy, and wheat, what we should be doing is subsidizing regenerative agriculture and lowering the healthcare burden costs, increasing the health span, which adds more productivity and more dollars into the ecosystem, into our economies, while sequestering carbon at the same time. And this is very simple. It is all there. It's already out there. It's already being designed. It's just us trying to apply it and getting that work done and being able to monetize it as we go along. Uh, and you know, this is why the work of what Nina Teicholz has been doing with the Nutrition Coalition is so important. This is where the work of what you've been doing with the Metabolic Health Society is so important because we need a top-down and a bottom-up approach to affect this change. To, uh, and it's going to take a long time. This is not going to be a quick revolution. But what will happen is there will sometime come to the tipping point. And whether or not that's in five years or whether or not that's in 10 years, I do not know. But the tipping point, and I think this is why the work of what Volick and Finney and Sami Inkin and Averta House have, have led the way, they're shining the light for the rest of the keto community to come on in with it. I think that is going to be the, the beacon for society. And we can really 
really change the, the paradigm um, globally. And I think that's exciting. And that's, that's why I do affordable testing, because I can have a market forcing function. We can change that boring farm bill that kills Americans. Yeah, Sorry, guess, long uh, question to a comment. <laughs> yeah, no, well, so I, mean, I just love this whole regenerative thing with all the, the work that Alan Savory is doing and, and everything. And uh, I'll, I'll maybe talk a bit more about that. If we got a couple of questions coming in here, I don't want to take up their time. Cecile's asking, um, how often would you test to start with and when? So um, generally, I like to do a baseline in, in the morning about an, about an hour after waking. The reason why it's an hour, you have a dawn phenomenon and that, that pops your blood glucose up a bit. So you want to kind of like see that, that come on down just a little bit. And so we'll generally do, do it once a day from the same finger stick. You can do both glucose and ketones to start with, and that'll give you your baseline. Uh, then as you're, you're testing for your foods, if you're seeing your blood glucose come on down, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, if you want to sleuth out a new meal, like say for instance, you're going to a new Indian restaurant and you've, you know, obviously you're, you're not ordering the rice and you're not ordering the, um, uh, the naan bread that is there, but you can actually order Indian food uh, and just get like broccoli and spinach as the side. But if you want to make sure that there's not too much of maybe some like chickpea flour in the sauce or something like that, you can test about an hour after eating that and see if it's had given you too much of a, of a push on up. Um, but this then, as you start testing to begin with, you test a lot. And then if you test and you're in ketosis, you test in ketosis and if you test and you're seeing your glucose being pretty stable and you're keeping yourself somewhere between 70 to 100, you know, in that zone, then you're doing good. And will you need to continue to test? The answer is no, the frequency will drop off. You end up testing for curiosity. And if we've done our job right, and if you've utilized the information that is out there, not only on our website, we have huge amount on our website. We do 15 new recipes almost every month. We've got massive amounts of recipes and foods and how-tos, and we have all of the low carb USA videos um, going back through time. the years. 147 hours. If you want to do a d deep dive COVID binge watch, it's all there for you. And, you know, I'm really happy that we could par partner with Doug and Pam to, to bring it out there, to, for him to be able to, to monetize that a little bit. You know, that's the problem of, of it's very expensive to put on these, these, these seminars. It's hugely expensive. And if there's no money coming in and supporting that, how do we get that word out? And, you know, that's why we set up the foundation. Uh, so going back to the original question, you test a lot to begin with. And as you learn, if you are a creature of habit, your free need of frequency to test drops off. And, but we also have to ask, why is that individual testing? The style of nutritional ketosis for somebody for epilepsy is going to be different for somebody who is reversing type 2 diabetes. It's going to be different to somebody who perhaps has a, a neurological multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's or something like that, or even psychological. We're seeing the work of Dr. Chris Palmer of what he's doing with schizophrenia and bipolar and ADHD to be really different. So your need to test is dependent on your why and on your bio-individuality. And I think that's the important piece to come on in. And we'll see more work coming out and more data sets on the utilization of testing and the frequencies. And I know that's where I look forward to seeing the work of the Metabolic Health Society as they take that seminal work of the standard of care and then just build it out into the requirements of the different disciplines that is necessary to create the right ecosystem of testing and need as, as you go forward. Krista's saying she loves her keto mojo. Is there, she says, she apologizes if she missed the first part of your talk. So if you mentioned it there, she's sorry. But is there a way to add notes to readings? Yes. And uh, first of all, you, if you go on in and click in onto the reading, you'll see that there is a notes section. Um, uh, I, we recommend that you sign up for My Mojo Health. Uh, just to go into the settings, we have created a secure HIPAA compliant encrypted health cloud. Uh, and that means you can save the data not only on your phone, but also to the cloud. And then we have built out a software developer kit and, a, and an API kit 
so then we can connect on things into other um, uh, applications like uh, chronometer, biomechanics, heads up health. Where in we've almost finished the beta with elation health. I think Dr. Tro and Dr. Lenskins will be really happy with that. Well, we, we've got a, a roadmap for another 30 EHR systems. So you'll be able to go in and make your, your notes and save them. And you will also be able to print those out in a CSV file format um, uh, right now. And that should, if I remember correctly, be available now for you to do with the latest edition of the, um, uh, of the app. And we'll see another update. We've been updating it roughly every two weeks. Uh, we have stopped updating it during the month of January just so that we had stability in, in the code. We didn't want to rock the boat if, um, uh, for everybody. But um, if, I, if I click on into my glucose reading here, and I don't know if we can bring it up there, you'll be able to see that notes section at the bottom, which I can say workout. And you can add the notes in. And you can also tag as well. So say, for instance, you want to tag uh, your post-workout reading, you could do that, or bike ride, or fasting, or anything in that nature, you can, you can do that. And so we have been adding to our app over every two weeks over the last um, a year and have built, built it out significantly. So that's a fantastic question. I mean, one of the things I didn't touch on was, of the benefits to the patient, you, you got me thinking on the notes there, so thank you for that question, was the psychological aspect of um, testing. You know, when I find myself doing long extended fasts, you know, you, you get that moment of like, oh, I'm hungry. And what I do at that moment is, you know, I, when I'm finding myself reaching into the refrigerator, is I test. Now, I normally know my ketones are between 1.1 and 1.7. That's my zone. I'm really happy with that. But when I'm on, on extended fast, they could be on 3.5s and 4s. So if I've got twice as much energy in my bloodstream, am I really hungry? And this is where the psychological aspect and training of testing is how we can beat out Pavlov's dog. And then that's the hard bit. Dr. Seifers was talking about carb addiction and the psychological changes that you need to change in people. Changing those habits, I think, is the hardest part. Uh, this is why people go, oh, I find keto is too hard. The only reason keto is hard is you didn't do it long enough. You didn't go through a proper keto boot camp. Why does the military put all of their recruits through an eight-week hard training program? Because they're changing habits. They're instilling new ones. They're bringing in that discipline that is required until that discipline is standard. It's easy for everybody to use because they've learned that piece. And this is the challenge that we need to get into society uh, and to make those changes. Um, you know, I know five o'clock, Pavlov rings the bell there and, and I want to have a beer. But beer's not right for me. You know, that was my problem. That's how I created my insulin resistance. That's how I got that beer belly. Um, you know, and, you know, one thing leads to the next. And next thing you know, you've done you're down on six of those little session stubbies and, and you, how much calories I've done there. Then you also go and have, you know, when you, it's, it's quite funny when you think about that carb addiction, milk chocolate hobnobs was my, my nemesis as well. You know, I go, oh, I'll have a cup of tea and I'll just, oh, I'll have one cookie. And I'd end up pile driving the whole packet. And this is how you've got to break that carb addiction. And that's the beauty of, of testing. Paddy wants to know, is it necessary to have a prescription to purchase a keto mojo? Not at all. You can get it on, um, uh, uh, hopefully directly from our website, but you can also get it on Amazon. And you can utilize your FSA and your HSA card in which to, to purchase it. And it's extremely affordable. I mean, yeah, Doug, you remember the days when I first started with you. Ketone testing was four bucks a strip. That's when true. we introduced our first meter, it, we managed to get it at a dollar a strip. And I remember Dr. Nasha Winters after saying she'd seen the product and she mentioned it. And I suddenly had this, this stampede of people coming towards me after one of your events. And I'm like, whoa, it was a game changer to have affordable testing. And now we've now introduced in October of, of last year our new next generation meter and we've lowered the cost of ketones by a further 20 percent so we're now at 80 cents a strip for ketones uh and when you buy the gki pack you're 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 at you know com combination you can get uh, 120 strips for for basically 50 cents so, so it's that's glucose and ketones together so super affordable 
And our goal with as we get scale is to lower that cost. If we can lower the barrier to entry and we can change the way that people shop the outer aisle, we can have that market forcing function. So yes, you can definitely, our goal eventually is to try and get it onto Medicare, Medicaid, and to also get it so that a doctor can prescribe it. That is a goal that we're working towards. But to get a doctor to prescribe it, you have to have a diagnosis. And right now, the diagnosis for getting a glucometer and, and, and the like is usually if you've got type two diabetes, but it doesn't help with some of all of these other metabolic um, diseases. So our goal is to get to that, to that area and we're working towards it. You know, I, you know, I, you know we, we think very American centric, but we are also now in Europe um, uh, through all the European nations, you know, it's, it's how do we get nations, single payer systems to change their approach? Uh, I look at the work that Vert has done. If suddenly in a single payer system, you could halve your, your cost for diabetes and you could reduce down that 91% of your insulin, what could that do to uh, a society that has universal health care. Yeah. I mean, think about that. You've got, ma you've got like, I come from Europe, I, I'm used to the taxation that was in Europe, but I also used to having universal health care. But m imagine reducing the health care costs and we focus on prevention and health span more than trying to fix the uh, transgressions of the past. Well, we make it right. easier for you to go to the restaurant and, you know, instead of saying, oh, I'm keto, and I see a, a, a waiter looking at me going like, oh, my God, here's another food fat person again, typical freaking Californian. You know, what it is is they, they go like, oh, I understand. Yeah, we've got it. We've got you covered. And it becomes the normal and not the freak normal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Chris is asking, um, she's saying she's find it very hard to buy it in Canada. Do you see that getting easier? Yes. I do see it getting really easy. Give me four months. We are already uh, in conversations for what's known as the MDSAP certification, which is required for Canada, Brazil, Japan, and Australia. Uh, it is a very difficult certification to, to get, but once you've got that, that then opens up the ability to then apply to the Canadian government to say, um, uh, we would like to put this in there and then we'll create special Canadian packaging in both Canadian French and um, uh, English and we will be there. But it's going to take us a, a few months for us to, to have that product, but it's in there. We have uh, a, a program that we wish to be able to have low cost testing globally. Uh, it'll take a long time. We're utilizing the, utilizing the affluence of America and Europe to subsidize the cost to go into these other nations where, whereby it, is, it might not make economical sense, but it makes societal sense. Uh, we should soon be in Chile and Argentina and Peru and Colombia, and that should hopefully be within the next two, um, uh, next 30 days, I think, um, uh, with some partnerships that we have down in the South America. We're obviously throughout the whole of the European Union and then we're working on other countries. So yes, definitely Canada is coming. It's, it's been a lot more difficult to get the MDSAP uh, certification uh, than, than we expected. It's a very complicated and difficult piece to get. Okay, Dave Cratchfield has an interesting thing here that I hadn't experienced. He says, have you have any tips opening the individual strip packaging without damaging them? He said, it happens too often. Uh, these ones here? It's really easy to open. I did my teeth there. It's really hard to, to damage these. Um, we also have changed the way that it's, it, it's done. I, can, I just opened it up like that. I just tip off the top there and you can see the strip is, is, is in there. It's really, really hard to actually damage it. You'll damage it if you're using scissors. And so there's some things that we've actually um, uh, changed on the original from the first generation of the, of the packaging. I'm gonna open this one up. If you notice on the first generation of packaging, I don't know if I can see that, in the back of the packet, there was a dehumidifying strip. Hold it up a bit. Uh, I'm gonna bring it up. I'm just trying to open it up so you guys can see the, um, uh, can you see in that? Inside there's a little down bit. Down, uh, down, down. 
That's there good. you go. There's a little dehumidifying white strip in, in there. Uh, that, so when we did the longevity studies, you know, there are some people who don't like the, don't like the packet, and I get it. Um, but uh, there's, there's specific reasons why we chose this. One, once you pop the top of the vial, your clock starts ticking. You've got only six months from when you first opened it up. And you'll notice inside that there is actually a dehumidifying um, uh, liner because humidity is the enemy. However, if you buy a packet of ketone strips and they're individually packaged, you open up one, you still have the full length of life and it's generally about 18 months. So on our first strip, we had a dehumidifying strip inside that was that, and that makes it harder to open. Um, but we were able to do the longevity studies, uh, which means that the temperature studies that we need to maintain, what are the temperature controls, what is the humidity, and that's how we got quickly. We have a second generation that is already in manufacture and is, has already been started in distribution that doesn't have that strip. It actually has a dehumidifying spray so that we can have the quality. So that'll make it easier, and we've slightly changed the way that there's a, the tear-off is done on the sachet to make it easier in that respect. Um, but it is really, really, it's really hard to, to damage it. I mean, I can open these up like that. You just don't, don't be timid. It's the only thing I say to people. Don't be timid and it is easier. But the advantage of the individually packaged is not only the longevity, is we did a heat study. Now we do recommend that you keep all strips at room temperature, is fine. But we did a heat study where we actually cooked the strips for two weeks at 65 degrees Celsius. That's 140 um, uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And we did that for two weeks and we didn't see any detriment in the, in, in the product um, uh, in that respect. And the goal of this was like, what do we, how do we manage the last mile? If we know if we're trying to do a, a global product and I want to, I want to be in the South during the heat of summer, and I need to use, um, uh, you know, the United States Postal Service. I want to be going to India or equatorial regions or island regions where they don't have as much as good um, refrigeration. Like, how do we do that? And we need to have the stability of the product. So that was the main reason that we moved over from that. And the other bit is the safety. You know, I mentioned about safety and that hypoglycemia. If you've had somebody that's popped the top of their glucose and they didn't put it back on properly and they got a large amount of humidity in there or they've gone over the six months and they're still using the strips, what if we get a bad reading? That's the worry. You know, on the old strips, we had a little spot for you to put in there, that white bit, to write when you opened the top of it. But nobody ever did that. Nobody wrote that down. And so there's that worry. And if somebody's adjusting their insulin, will they get that wrong? And so we understood, you know, like people go like, well, you know, I got, I've got the wastage from the foil versus this. Well, this is, can't be recycled anyway because it's got a dehumidifying liner. And there's only one gram difference between a pack of these and a pack of these, one gram, which means when you drive one, drive one mile, that's 161 grams of of, of, of carbon that you've got a problem with. And we have one gram in, in 60. And imagine then if you take it further, if you're looking at the life cycle, if we're starting to make people shop the outer aisle with nutrient dense foods and they're needing less foods and less journeys to get that food there, and they're doing partial raised meats and they're sequestering carbon, how much of a problem is there? Uh, and when we weighed all of that out, we felt that the individual packaging was the best way. I do know that some people love popping the top and i'm sorry you made that change but you know we, we felt it was for the for the for the better good uh, and i hope that people understand that and um, we'll continually to to evolve the product as we as we go along you know when we laid up everything to to lower the cost to homogenize manufacturing between america and europe so you know the the actual this piece here that we, we manufacture, we can use that for both countries. What we do have to change is the outside packaging for both countries. So this was the way that we could scale up really, really easily um, for, for both countries and utilize that to, to lower the cost as we go along. And that's my goal. I mean, my goal is like, why 
we should be able to get this down to the to cost of what glucose strips are now over time. But we have a stranglehold by some companies where we buy the enzyme from, which is a thousand times more expensive than the enzyme uh, that is used for glucose. We need to get the quality of manufacturing up so we can work in larger batches so that we're able to, to get efficiency in, in that piece. And you can only do that by getting scale. If you don't get scale, you're never going to get those, those, uh, the costs down. Uh, and you know, for 80 cents, that might not be much for an American, but it is expensive for somebody on an island. Is it expensive for somebody um, uh, in India or Pakistan where we're seeing like obesity rates of these Western diseases just spiraling up. Uh, Christy Ross is asking where she can locate the billing code. So I'm going to put this uh, presentation in the breakouts folder in the Dropbox with all the slide mm -hmm. decks in so you can see it on there. But I'm sure there's another way you can find it, right? Yeah, we have full PDFs on that one. Just send us, ping us a message on our website through our messenger or email support at ketomojo.com just saying, hey, can you send me the PDF and CPT codes? I'm sure Lamont will be, who hands, heads up our, our medical division, will be happy to send you out all of the information that we have on um, uh, CPT coding to make and it that's more keto -mojo, to That's keto-mojo, right? It's keto-mojo.com? Yeah. Or either one? If either one, I have both. keto-mojo without the dash, will it still work? Yep, should do. Okay, there we go. Um, all right, we're getting close to where we get, we need to shut down here so that I can get ready for this afternoon. Um, maybe Cecile's asking about uh, the Ketogenic Foundation. How's that going? Yeah. You have, any, have you made any grants yet? What's going on? Yes, we have. We were very proud to work with Doug and Pam and Robert Sivers of the Metabolic Health Society. You know, we met with them and you know, they were trying to set this up. And we were able to grant ten thousand dollars to them to to get going and get set, set up, uh, which so firmly meant with our educational goals and supporting um, um, the the society, in, in that respect. So we're really pleased to be able to do that. Uh, we are working with Cedar Sinai Hospital. Um, they've got a clinical trial that is that is coming up, and so we'll be doing some grants with that. So far. We have about half a million uh, in the, uh, we have, uh, sorry, Gemma just, just, just told me I was wrong. She just sent me a message to say, it's Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, not Metabolic Health Society. Okay, guys. Consider yourself shut up, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, we've got about half a million. And the goal is with that half a million right now is that is being put into very safe investments. And then what happens is we will each year have the investments that will come off that that we begin to use to start to um, afford it. And the goal is to build that endowment over time. Uh, you, know, you know, if you think that some investments can get 6% per annum out of that, if you've got a million dollars there, that's $60,000 that you can give away a year. If we get that to 10 million, that's 600,000. Now we're starting to get some serious money. And the reason why we've got it as a 501c3 is we want the ability for people to be able to donate. Um, and that donation to come on, to start coming on in and we can get the feedback from there. So it is a small moves. But it's getting, it's, it's, it'll, it'll get there. Um, and, you know, Gemma and I, we don't have children. Uh, what is our legacy going to be? That we, we made a buck? Or is our legacy that we were able to, to, make a, to make a difference? And that's what we are, are marching, marching towards. So, yeah. Okay. Good question. Brilliant. Um, so I'm going to have to shut this down now. Peggy, just... Um, Peggy's asking, um, she says, there's so many differing opinions on keto and LCHF. How do we come together? And my answer is, is we've just talked about it here. If you listen to my talk right at the beginning, uh, Adele's one right after that. Dr. Rob Sivis, who's also on our board of directors, um, on his talk yesterday afternoon. The whole idea of the SMHP is to create exactly that, to create an umbrella for everybody to come together to everybody, there's all sorts of different nuances and different protocols and all of that. And we have different ideas about how, how it needs to get done, but we have a, a, a binding fundamental 
philosophy about not using drugs, reducing carbohydrates and lifestyle interventions. And mm -hmm. everybody that believes in that and, and wants to work in that space now has, now has a place to be. And that's what we're yeah. so excited about with this organization because um, we really believe it's going to provide that umbrella for everyone. Good question. Okay, and then so thank you very much, Darian, for everything you do as well. Thank you very much for your donation because without that, we wouldn't have been able to get this thing off the ground. <laughs>